for them, but weird for us. For sure. Hear me okay? See me okay? Have your Bibles ready to dive in. What's that? <laughs> Where, oh, we you live in Paris? Yeah. Which reminds me, I should, I should put this up on the screen. Facebook live stream as we teach this class and updates me on any questions they get asked. I'm going to try to multitask and, and watch it here. So if you see me looking at my phone, it's not because I'm checking my latest bid on YouTube memorabilia on eBay. I am trying to see if any questions have come through in the chat. So uh, today we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 22 verses 1 through 23 where we're going to see what, um, there was something foreshadowed uh, a few chapters ago, and we're going to see the results of that uh, today. Uh, as always, I um, want you to know that if there are ever any changes on the schedule, uh, which are coming up at the end of this month, not really changes, but there will be a Sunday that, or a Wednesday that we don't meet, I will be in um, Camp Allen for the Diocese of Texas's Clergy Conference. And that's on the calendar that you have. If you don't have the calendar, make sure you pick it up on the way out. And if you're not on the email list, you can write your email in the uh, sign-in sheet in the back. And Hillary will make sure you stay in the loop with everything or anything that might happen. All right. Any questions before we begin from last week or previous discussions? All right. Well, I want um, to begin with a question. Have you ever felt, this is sort of the song for today, as well as the question to kind of get our creative juices flowing. Um, there's a song by B.B. King in which he says, ain't nobody loved me but my mama, and she may be jiving too. He feels completely alone and like the whole world has turned against him. Uh, and I'm curious, is, is, have you ever felt like the whole world has turned against you? And if you can think of an example, anything you'd want to share. And I'll, I'll give you one recently from uh, somebody in my family who had sort of a crisis at work, a hurricane that was coming, so school was closed, and the, um, the this is, I'll tell you, my sister, and so she had, she was off work watching the kids and her husband's job, they had some major crisis, there, so he had to go in. It just felt like one of those things where everything kind of happens at once. I don't know if you've ever, um, uh, we had somebody who was driving to the retreat in Camp Allen and they got a flat tire uh, and uh, they just were on the side of the road. The kids were sort of dealing with that as kids will deal with that. If you've ever felt like just, you can't catch a break, can you think of any situations in your life where you felt a little bit like that? Anybody care to share a recent bad day in your life? You don't have to, but <laughs> anything comes to mind. I have something. Yeah, take it, Sandy. When I was a teenager, this is really a lot. My boyfriend broke up with me, 
Mm -hmm. My mother was sick, mm -hmm. and uh, about a week later she died. Mm. And then about a week after that, I had a wreck. Mm. And about a week after that, I was I had a day. And at that time, you could rent motorcycles. Do y'all remember that at gas stations? Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong? Yes. Well, I had another wreck. <laughs> wow. So that that was an awful lot for a 17 year old. Absolutely. And it was just a real. I just felt like. Nobody liked me. I was depressed. It was a really bad time. Yeah, two wrecks. Mother died. Mother died. Boyfriend broke up. Boyfriend broke up with you. Was worse. <laughs> yeah, those are all really traumatic things, and to have that all happen at once. So, uh, we're going to see two different responses to crisis crises. There, are, this chapter is going to look at David and look at Saul, and we see them held up as examples of how to respond to situations like that when everything goes wrong. There's different ways to respond. So we'll take a look uh, at that today. Uh, Leanne Williams, good morning to you. I see that you've uh, joined the class online. Good to see you. And um, if, by the way, online people, hello. If you have any questions at any time during the discussion, feel free to type them in and I'll see if I can uh, respond uh, via the live stream. Okay. So, as you remember last week, David so is in high, he's on the run. And he's on the run because King Saul, his father-in-law, is against him. And is convinced that David is out to get him. Now, Saul has lost the kingship. He knows that he's going to lose the kingship. He knows that it's hanging by a thread. He doesn't know when he's going to be ousted, but he, know, he knows that that's coming. And so he's nervous about that, and he's been blaming David for it. And... Uh, and he is sort of losing his grip on reality. And uh, David, who's fearing for his life because Saul has tried to kill him three times, is hiding in caves. And last week we saw that he went to um, uh, the city of Gath. And he, per he tried to hire himself out as a mercenary just to be able to, you know, have some employment and take care of himself and his family, presumably. And the king of Gath, um, or his servants, recognized who David was because he was a well-known social media influencer. And they said, this is David who kills all of the enemies of Israel. You really want him in your house? And so to save his own skin, David pretended to be someone who's having some sort of psychotic break or break with reality. He just started kind of blathering nonsense and drooling on his beard and doing his uh, best impression of somebody who needs to be committed. Uh, and that's, that's what, so that was not going to be a long-term option for him. So he leaves there. And again, um, you need to have in mind someone who's fleeing, somebody who has lost everything, somebody whose whole life has fallen apart, someone who doesn't get to go home to his wife and children and say, honey, I'm home. Uh, if you've seen Pleasantville, a movie with William Macy, uh, he comes home one day and his wife has... Uh, changed her mind about her whole situation. She no longer wants to be at home cooking dinner for him when he gets home. And he comes home and he says, Honey, I'm home, and the house is silent. That happens about four times, and he's completely flummoxed. He doesn't know, his universe has been turned upside down. So this has happened to David, but in, uh, you know, times a thousand. He's on the run, he's had to uh, beg for food, He's had to beg for a weapon. He's now carrying around Goliath's sword because he borrowed it from the priest. And you have to remember that when he went to, he basically went to church for refuge. And when he was in the church, he asked the priest, can I have some bread? And the priest gave him some old communion bread, essentially is what happened. And so he's got that for him and maybe the handful of men who are with him. And then he goes to Gath, has to pretend that he's insane, and then um, leaves from there. He's doesn't get much more bottom of the barrel. Think about somebody who's been anointed as king. He has to pretend that he's a madman so he doesn't get killed because his own father-in-law wants to kill him. I mean, it's just all falling apart. Have you ever had to beg for food? Maybe some of you have. You'd be amazed how many people, if you grew up um, in a family where poverty was a reality, where there was hunger and you actually had to beg for food or um, uh, go to a food pantry, you'd be amazed the number of people who've gone through a time in their life where that was true. And so this is David's situation. Uh, 
And so he goes to the cave of Adullam, and the story picks up here. The one thing you have to remember though, as you read is that when he went to church, when he went to um, the um, Israelite worship center at Gebeah, when he was there a few when he was begging for bread from the priest, we learned at that time that a man named Doeg the Edomite was there. And this was one of Saul's kind of main guy, sort of in Saul's cabinet. Secretary of Transportation, maybe. He's in, and he's there, and Doeg the Edomite hears David ask for bread, ask for the sword or a weapon or something like that. So he witnessed, Doeg witnessed the whole thing. And we just heard about that, and it was sort of, it was mentioned and left. Um, kind of part of the literary craft of 1 Samuel. We get that little foreshadowing hint, and we're going to pick up today uh, with what happened. So uh, he's going to go to this place called Adullam, which is between Gath, the city where he was pretending to be insane, and Bethlehem. And there's probably a cave um, nearby. All right, so let's pray and read. Almighty God, as we read here about David and Saul, help us to see what you would have us see that would be helpful to us in our lives, whether the crises we face are small or large, or just large to us. Find us help us to find some hope in this passage. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. David departed from there, meaning Gath, where he was pretending to be insane, and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him, and he became captain over them. And there were with him about four hundred men. Pause a second. Anybody remember what David's hometown is? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. So, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Uh, David is from Bethlehem, and uh, you'll remember that uh, the prophet Samuel had gone to Bethlehem to anoint David and his brothers, and that whole uh, situation happened in Bethlehem. Just important to remember, again, Jesus, one of his titles is Son of David. Uh, and it's not for nothing that he's from Bethlehem. Remember, Joseph was of the... Remember, you read in the, every December, get, get ready, it's coming up in a few weeks. Um, uh, as Hobby Lobby and Target will already have you know, Christmas is coming. <laughs> and you'll hear the story that uh, Joseph went down to Bethlehem because he was at the house and line of David. That's right. So Bethlehem is his hometown. So um, uh, as I told you, uh, this... this um, this uh, Adullam, the city, is halfway between Gath and Bethlehem. So when it says his father and brothers, his family, come down to check on him, it's because they're sort of nearby. He's in the neighborhood, and somehow they've heard it. So they all go down to him. So everyone who is in distress, who is in debt, everyone who is bitter in soul, gathered to David, and he became captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. And David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother stay with you till I know what God will do for me. And he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, Do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Now Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men who were with him, Saul was sitting at Gebeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse, who's that? David, right. Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds that all of you have conspired against me? No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, 
who stood by the servants of Saul. I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Then the king sent to summon Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests who were at Nob, and all of them came to the king. And Saul said, Here now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword, and have inquired of God for him, so that he has risen against me to lie in wait as at this day? Then Ahimelech answered the king, and who among all your servants is so faithful as David, who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard and honored in your house? Is today the first time that I have inquired of God for him? No, let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand also was with David. And they knew that he, had, that he fled and did not disclose it to me. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. And the king said to Doeg, You turn and strike the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned and struck down the priests. And he killed on that day eighty-five persons who wore the linen ephod. And no, the city of the priests, he put to the sword. Both man and woman, child and infant, ox, donkey, and sheep he put to the sword. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named <coughs> Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Dog the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me you shall be in safe keeping. <coughs> okay. Well, a bit grim, this story. Questions or things that jump out at you, things that struck you as we read that story? What's on your list of stuff that you want to talk about? Did the court already know Saul was nuts? Did the court know that Saul was nuts? I think it's a pretty safe bet. Uh, there, yeah, I mean, if, if you've ever known a leader who will not um, tolerate dissent, questioning, uh, it, and retaliates against anyone who speaks up, they all know what's going on, but no one will say anything about it. You get a hint of that when he, he commands his guards to kill the priests, and the priests refuse. Seems to me there's already some uh, uh, resistance to Saul because they know what's going on. Yeah, David? Uh, God said, you won't like it. I'll give you a king, but you won't like it. And this is one more in the litany of what we get ourselves into. Yeah, so it's when they yeah, when they ask for a king, that's why you got to be careful what you ask for and what you pray for. They had asked for a king, and God gave them a king. But God warned them, this is going to be bad news. Samuel warned them, uh, and they knew that, you know, he said, you're going to get taxed. You're going to, I mean, and that's sort of implied here what's going on. The fact that it says, uh, so let me ask you guys, who joined David? David is camped at Adullam near Bethlehem, which is not, it's a, Bethlehem's like a suburb of Jerusalem. Um, and these people kind of flocked to him when they found him, he's there. What are these people like? What do we learn about them in verse 2? Discontented. 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 Yeah, they're discontented. Anything else? In debt. In debt. Things aren't going well. Things are going so well. Yeah. They're in debt potentially because they've had to pay taxes to support a standing army. Uh, and um, they clearly don't like leadership. Inflation is going crazy. Gas prices are high. There's a problem on the border. All these Canaanites are coming in. 
and so they're mad at the king. Yeah. Distress and debt, and also bitter in soul, or as Victor said, discontented. Um, it's this uh, strong, strong language. They're they're very unhappy. They've gotten what they wanted, and now they're unhappy. Um, Who is the prophet of Gad? Yeah, that is a great question. The text, like in many things, assumes that we know who this is, but it, it gives no introduction. Okay. And it indicates, in a lot of these times, uh, the oral tradition emerged in a time when everybody knew who the characters were, so they didn't have, you know, if, you, if I say David Beckham, some of you know who I'm talking about. If I say Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, some of you know who I'm talking about. If I say Billy Joel, some of you know who I'm talking about. But a thousand years from now, people might not know who those people are. So, um, But he was a legitimate He was a legitimate prophet, prophet. yes. Okay, so uh, they've gotten what they wanted, and they don't like it. What else uh, jumped out at you or struck you in this passage? Yeah. It's not public knowledge. It hasn't been proclaimed or legislated, decreed. And he said, you should have known this is the bad guy. Well, yeah. How? Yeah. That's a good, that's a good observation. Well, let's, let's, let's walk through this, and we'll see what we can get out. For Again, remember, these are two, two people in crisis. David is on the run, fearing for his life, been stripped of all his possessions, begging for food, living in a cave. He's in crisis. Saul is in crisis. He has lost his authority. He's feeling uh, nervous about his future and the uncertainty that surrounds him. And how they respond is, is really different. And I think we can take something from it. Um, all right. So David goes to this cave. This is, uh, to some extent, hitting again, hitting the bottom of the barrel. Pretending, so try to be a mercenary compromising his principles, being to hire himself out to a group of people who are Gentiles, worship the wrong God, do all kinds of unclean things, he would have had to be around all kinds of unclean people, and he's willing now to fight for them against his own people. That's how bad that was, to be a mercenary against the Israelites, working for Gath. Like, I'm going to go hire myself out uh, to the Taliban. I want to like, you know, during the conflict in Afghanistan, I, as an American, wanted to work for the Taliban to fight against American troops. That's sort of what he was willing to do, just to put food on the table, take care of himself. That didn't work, so he had to pretend to be insane so that the Taliban didn't kill him. And then uh, he managed to leave that, and now he's got no more options, so he's in a cave. Now, he's got some family that hear about it. And they go and they see him, and then other people hear about what's going on. Now, so David clearly has a decent reputation. So now he begins to be the, uh, this cave turns into the headquarters for the revolution. Think the Miserables building the barricades on the streets of Paris to fight against the evil government. Uh, think about... Um, uh, Lexington Concord in 1776, fighting against those horrible redcoats of King George III, um, and um, the leaders of the rebellion that start drawing people to them. Who, who, in the American Revolution, who was in favor of overthrowing King George III? It wasn't the rich people, it wasn't the governors, it wasn't the people appointed by the king to manage the colonies, it was the people down here who resented the taxes. Who, I mean, yes, there were some intellectual leading lights who were writing books about it and writing letters and pamphlets, and you have your, your um, Benjamin Franklins and your uh, Thomas Paines, but there's a lot of people that are really, the people who really resent the king, a lot of them are the folks kind of down here, which is often the case in, or in a revolutionary situation. The Bolsheviks revolted against the Tsar and the Russian nobles in the Chinese Communist Revolution as well. It's always sort of the underclasses that are fighting against the, the perceived upper classes. So that's what's happening here. Everyone who's in distress, everyone who owes money, everyone who's bitter in soul, the discontented people, the folks that are affected by these policies of Saul, they're the ones that flock to David. And, he, and he's got 400. So 
maybe not the biggest, but he's got his 400 men, and he's commander. So we get an indication that David is this natural leader. People are, are drawn to him. And so he goes to Mizpah of Moab. If I, is anybody here nerdy enough in biblical things to know anything about Moab? Does that bring anything to mind for you? Any biblical story you've heard? If you've heard the word Moab before, any? <laughs> Ruth, praise God. Ruth the Moabitess. Some of you have heard, maybe at your wedding, you chose a passage um, from Ruth, something like, I will be yours and you will be mine, and wherever you go, I will go, and all that sort of thing. You didn't know it, you were quoting a Moabite. Now Moab, the Moabites were hated. Uh, this is near Israel. It's kind of like Jordan area now. And these were folks who had done the Israelites wrong way back when. And so they were under kind of this, we'll hate you for a thousand generations sort of curse between the Israelites and the Moabites. Which is why it was so, it indicates how desperate Ruth and her husband, or Naomi and her husband were, that they went to Moab from Israel when there was a famine in that book called Ruth. It's going into the enemy. It's, uh, um, it's, it's like somebody from Texas going to Vermont for food, you know? It just gets a joke. Okay. Anyway. Uh, so they, um, the Moabites were seen as bad. But who is David's um, grandfather? Who's Jesse? So David is the son of Jesse, we know from this passage. Who is Jesse's dad? Anybody? Remember from the book you just mentioned. I know. He didn't know it was going to be a quiz. Nobody's going to come back next week. They felt too ashamed. Um, <coughs> Obed. That's right. So, and who were Obed's parents? Ruth and Mr. Ruth. Boaz. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, David's great-grandparents, or one of them, where they were, he, he has Moab roots. Um, and so he goes to the king of Moab. B because he's got, um, because his, his uh, grandfather was the son of a Moabitess, you know, there's some indication here maybe that that's how he gets an entree into Moab. So he's, he's, um, he's in this dangerous situation. His, his whole family is in danger. Obviously we've seen how Saul can, like just, if, if I don't like you, I don't like you and your whole family kill everybody. So David wants to protect his parents. And so he goes to the king of Moab and he says, let mom and dad, can Jesse and my mom stay with you? Um, and he leaves him with the king of Moab. Again, this is for most Israelites, Moab is the enemy. So for David to go to the enemy and say, can you take care of my mom and dad? Just shows his desperation. It shows how his own, his own people, in a sense, have turned against him. His own king, his own, the, his own government has turned against him, uh, and, um, and he's, he's defecting, in a sense. He's going to the enemy and saying, take care, of my, take care of my parents. And so they end up staying there for a long time. And then we get this word, Gad, the prophet says to David, do not remain in the stronghold, depart, go to the land of Judah. Uh, the stronghold is that cave in Abdullah. It could also mean the stronghold in Moab. It's not really clear, but wherever he's saying, he's saying, you can't stay here. You have to go to the land of Judah. Judah is south of, um, uh, it's the southern part of Israel. It's where Jerusalem is. I just took a note saying the sound is cutting in and out. I'm going to see what I can do. I'll move some things around. Thank you for letting me know and let me know if this helps or doesn't. So he goes down to the land of Judah, the forest of Hereth. We don't know where Hereth is. Archaeologists have not been able to really determine where that is. Um, but there's somebody there who warns him to get away, so he gets away. So, that's our first little chunk here. Anybody want to guess about David's state of mind here? And this is pure subjective conjecture. There's nothing, it doesn't say, but anybody want to guess what he's maybe feeling at this point? <coughs> How would you be feeling at this point? Desperate? Desperate? Angry. Angry? Yeah. What else? What 
knows now that he's put his whole family at risk. Yeah, he knows he's put his whole family at risk. Absolutely. It's a very, very difficult feeling to have. Yeah, maybe questioning God. He was anointed as king. He's supposed to be king. Why is it taking so long? And why is my family at risk? And all that. Yeah, questioning God. Absolutely. And why are 85 priests dead because of me? And why are 85 priests dead because of me? Yeah, and that's going to come later. He's not there yet, but he's going he's gonna to have to have that going on as well. Okay, so he, uh, he very well might be in a bad way. So now we turn to Saul. And Saul hears that David was discovered. Basically, that he, he hears through the grapevine... We now know where David is. Uh, and he's at Gibeah, which is the central place of Hebrew worship at this point. Uh, we get this image of him under a tree on the height with a spear in his hand. What might that indicate? In he's in a fighting mood. So a high place. What can you do when you're in a, a, a high uh, on the height? We see all around. Uh, and he's, he's with a spear in his hand. Now, he's the king. He's like the, you know, he's the commander-in-chief. He's usually not in the cavalry. But here he is with his weapon drawn in his hand. It's sort of like he's, uh, he's fingering his holster, and even more than that, he's kind of pulled it out, safety's off, and he's kind of, you know, twirling it around or something. Like, he's, he's ready to go. He doesn't need to have a spear in his hand. He's got all these guards around him. It's like the president has a secret service, so he does not have to be packing. The president does not have a holster because that's what the secret service is for. Here, he's got a holster, and he's, um, there's no battle that's imminent, but he's ready to fight. And then he gives this speech to his servants. Now, who does he... He addresses a specific group of people in verse 7. He doesn't just say, Dear servants, who is he talking to? Who's tribe? Who does he, what does he call them? Benjamites. Yeah, Benjamites or people of Benjamin. That's his tribe. It's worth noting that as a leader, he's only surrounded himself with his, his family. Nepotism. Right? Not uncommon. Not uncommon. And people don't like it today if the opposite party does it. Right? When Clinton was the president, we didn't like that Hillary was helping him. When Trump was president, we didn't like it that Jared and Ivanka were helping him. Nobody likes nepotism, but it's very common uh, that we get people that are around us. And sometimes, not always, it can be a sign of, um, I don't trust people outside of my own thing. Or in many countries today where nepotism is, is sort of the name of the game, it, it's, it's not rare. It's, it's, it's always what happens. It's sort of seen as when you're in power, you try to benefit your own people. Like, I have been put in power, and I'm going to use it to help my family. I'm going to feather my nest, as it were. Um, it is not, generally speaking, the sign of a confident leader, um, uh, it meaning uh, if you do this, if you're afraid of having people outside of your tribe as your close advisors, you may not be the most confident leader. So he's surrounded himself with, you can sort of think of this, he's surrounded himself with yes-men. People that are, you know, already kind of beholden to him a little bit. Uh, and he's mad at them because he's sort of saying, I, we had this deal. You're my people. I helped you. I put you in positions of power. I've given you all this stuff, fields, lands. I've, like, it, and what this means is he's confiscated fields from other people to give to his own family. Uh, and vineyards. And I've put you in charge of the army, um, which is, it would be of great benefit to you. And now you're turning against me. We had a deal, quid pro quo. I put you in my cabinet. I put you in charge of my military. I put you, I give you lots of stuff. I, and now, you're, now you don't tell me when my own son turns against me. Uh, interesting that he never mentions the name of David. He can't bring himself to do it. Just the son of Jesse. Uh, what would you say, you know, you can take some time, read it again, or look over it, or just maybe something has already come to mind, but what is Saul's state of mind here? Fearful. What? Fearful. Fearful, yeah. Paranoid. What's that? Paranoid. Paranoid. Absolutely paranoid. You're all conspiring against me. You're all against me. After all I've done for you, what else?
Everybody have a family member who's like this? After all I've done for you, this is how you treat me. How, how would you describe that person? Narcissist. Narcissist. Yeah. Ungrateful. Ungrateful. Yeah. He thinks they're ungrateful, but really he's not really realizing the sacrifices they've made to be with him. Yeah, a narcissist is sort of one of the classic traits is if you're not totally for me, you're against me. If you're not 100% on my side, if you ever question me even once, you must be my enemy and I will now turn against you. And the, a narcissist is not able, like if I'm a narcissist and Sandy does something that I don't like, she's now 100% bad. I'm not able to see that there's some good things about her and maybe some things that I don't like or I disagree with. And maybe the problem's me. Like that's what a mature, emotionally healthy person can do. And narcissists are like, if Sandy said to me, I didn't like that hymn on Sunday, can we have a different one next week? What? You're against me? Get out. That's a typical narcissist response. And this is what he's saying. Like, um, uh, and the, the demand of complete loyalty above all things and no ability to see that maybe their questioning of him has something to do with his own actions. There's, um, a narcissist is famously unable to be self-aware. Um, none of you is sorry for me what is that? What kind of state of mind? He's mad. This is um, in the second half of verse 7. None of you was sorry for me. Victim mentality. Victim mentality. Yeah. Self-pity. This is the pity party. I heard somebody <laughs> recently who must have heard somebody say the term pity party, but the person who said pity party must have had an English accent. So this American person said, I'm having a real pity potty. And I said, no, no, you're not. But yeah, it, like just oozing self-pity. Like none of you is sorry for me. Um, there's some real emotional manipulation going on here. Um, yeah, victim mentality, woe is me. Um, none of you tell me that my son is against me. Um, so... He makes this very narcissistic, paranoid, self-pitying, victim mentality speech um, where he blames everybody but himself for his problems. Uh, no one's had it as hard as me. No one's suffered this witch hunt and persecution. This is the greatest hoax ever and you're all responsible. This has never happened before and this is all happening to me and you all are the worst. Nobody speaks up for me. I've done more for you than anybody's ever done for you. I've been the greatest king that Israel's ever had, and you haven't done you any. And this is the kind of treatment I get, this kind of attack and persecution and these witch hunts. Well, somebody is happy to step into the gap and say, I'm still a good, faithful servant. I'll be your lapdog. Doeg the Edomite. And he now gives, he spills the spills the beans. I saw son of Jesse come into Nob and tells him all that happened. And so then we have this really awful thing uh, where Ahimelech is brought in and all the priests, 85, by the way, side note, indication of what a big operation it was at Gebeah or any central place for worship in Israel. In Israel, you know, St. Albans has one rector, an associate rector, a deacon, and an assisting priest. So four clergy. Israel has 85. Why do they have eight? And they wear the linen ephod, that it's the priestly garment. Why do they um, have so many? Because when you're the priests for a nation of several thousands of people and your main job is to sacrifice animals, you've got to be sacrificing animals all day long. Uh, and so, uh, so it's, a, it's a big operation. So, anyways, he says to him, what's, what's the first thing that Saul accuses Ahimelech of doing? Conspiring. Conspiring against me. Now, what did Ahimelech actually do? Did he conspire against Saul? What was he, what was he doing when David approached him? 
Not a trick question. He's doing nothing. He's just doing his job. Just being a priest, you know. He thought David was on the king's business. Why do you think David was on the king's business? Because David told him. David said, I'm on a secret mission for King Saul. And I need some help. And I had to leave in such a hurry. I don't have any supplies. Can you give me something? So he, so um, the, one of the traits of a narcissistic leader and many people, because everybody can have a touch of narcissism about us. It's essentially being extremely self-centered. And we all can be self-centered from time to time. And often when we feel wronged, we have a narrative in our head of what happened. I wasn't invited to the party. They must hate me. It's probably because of that thing that I said that one time 10 years ago. And really, what just happened was there was a, their, their iPhone updated, there was a malfunction with their contact list, and your name somehow got left off the email. And they didn't notice it. That could, yet we say, oh, I was left off, it was intentional. So, uh, here Saul says, not, hey, Ahimelech, can you help me understand what happened? Doeg over here says that David came to you and got some bread and got a sword. Is that what happened? And then Ahimelech said, oh, yeah, totally. But you know, as I do, Saul, he was working for you. He told me about that secret mission. No, Saul does not try to understand the background. He has the narrative in his head. I know what happened, and I'm not going to listen to anybody who says anything. I got to give it to Ahimelech that he answers uh, gently but firmly to say, with reality. Have you ever tried to give someone a dose of reality that doesn't want to hear it? That's what Ahimelech does here. He says, let the record show, King Saul. Like, clearly, I can see what's happening, and I'm toast here. But let the record show that there is no one who's more loyal to you than David. He is captain of your bodyguard. He is your son-in-law. And he's honored in your house. By the way, I've prayed for him, you know, where he says, I've inquired of God. Like, basically, David's going to do something and goes to the priest and says, can you tell me, should I do this? Should I not do this? Can you ask God's blessing for me? That's what, and, and he says, this isn't the first time this has happened. David has come to me many times for spiritual counsel, as have lots of people. Uh, and um, he said, I didn't know anything about any of this. Even, he says, much or little at the end of verse 15. I didn't know even the tiniest scrap. And how does Saul respond to this dose of reality, this truth? He should you should have known. And what you should have known. You should die. Yeah, you should have known and you should die. Uh, and then he gives this order to kill Ahimelech, and not only Ahimelech, um, but every single priest, everybody who was there. Um, the, in verse 17, how do the servants of the king respond to this command to kill all the priests? They refuse. They're conscientious objectors. They refuse the order of the military, the commander-in-chief. A direct order. They disobey. My translation says they refused to kill the priests of the Lord. They refused to kill the priests of the Lord, which, again, um, yeah, this is they would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. So they realize that they've been asked to do something that is beyond the pale. And if all the priests of the Lord are killed, what happens to the worship of Yahweh and the whole sacrificial system and the ceremonial system of Israel? What happens? It's gone. There's no more Christmas Eve, no more Easter Sunday, uh, no more sacrifices to make right with the Lord. He's, it's, it's hard to imagine a worse sin, honestly, because God has given the people these priests who are the mediators between God, Yahweh, and the people of Israel. They're the telephone operators that allow you to call God. They're the ones that allow you to have your life made right spiritually when you've got on a, on a bad path. And Saul says, because of a personal vendetta that comes out of my paranoid, narcissistic mind, I'm going to end this for everybody. I, um, this is the sort of spiteful action, again, that a narcissistic leader will do. I'll take the whole ship down with me, 
rather than acknowledge any sort of error on my part. One could say that uh, uh, taking men in their 50s and 60s in Russia to go fight Ukraine rather than acknowledge maybe this is not going so well and may, I may have bitten off more than I can chew and this is now kind of an unwinnable situation. More people have died for fighting for Russia now than all the Americans that died in the Vietnam War. And it's a much, and it, we've been doing this for like six months. And now we're going to send, now Russia wants to, so the, um, the inability to acknowledge maybe I'm in a bad path, I'm going to, I'm going to take this whole thing down. 700,000 uh, people have, maybe a million have left Russia since the beginning of the war just because they see the writing on the wall even though the population is already declining and you get a special payment if you had babies in Russia. So now that's like, now the population has just fallen off a cliff. Men dying, people leaving, all of that. Uh, but no, I'm gonna take it all down with me. I don't care who I hurt, who I have to kill to try to get what I want. I will not ever admit defeat. And that's sort of the mentality that Saul has here. Um, I will, eliminate the ability for people to have a relationship with God because I'm mad at my son-in-law and I won't get help and I won't admit any failure or flaw. Um, and he has these 85 people killed and the entire city of Nob. He wipes off the face of the map. Uh, this is a, a scorched earth sort of policy. Uh, I'm going to check online. Any questions here? Don't see any. Judith mentioned the sound was cutting in and out. I hope it's improved. Um, and Leanne, who's driving to Dallas, please keep your eyes on the road. All right. So uh, one escapes Abiathar. We talked about Abiathar last time because Abiathar is the one that Jesus mentions when he talks about this story. When Jesus... Um, uh, is accused, as he often is, of breaking rules and playing a little loosely with the rules around the Sabbath in particular and his eating rules and all that. Jesus talks about David eating the holy bread of the priests in that, this story here. And he says, Have you not heard the days of Abiathar when David ate the holy bread that the priests gave him? And we talked about how the fact that it was actually Ahimelech was the priest, not Abiathar. And some people point to that and say, ah, there's a conflict in Scripture. Well, here we see that Abiathar was very much around and involved in this whole story. Um, and it was, as Jesus said, in the days of Abiathar. And Abiathar is the one that actually now joins David's uh, kind of little ragtag rebellion. Um, and David's response when Abiathar shows up and tells Saul, tells David that Saul has killed his father and all the priests, David's response is different than how Saul would have responded in a similar situation. Saul would have said something like, well, serves them right, or something like that. David here acknowledges his own culpability, acknowledges uh, the wrongness of it, and tries to make amends on some level. So he says, I, I saw Doeg, the Edomite, there, which we didn't know earlier. We read that Doeg was there. We didn't know that David had seen him, but David now comes clean. He didn't have to say that. He could have said, oh, Abiathar, that is awful. I'm so sorry. Come join my group. We'll take care of you. And he could have left out the little part where it was kind of his fault, or at least he had given it, he had had a chance to see that Doeg was there. You ever tell a lie by not telling the truth? You know, you don't actually verbalize a, de a deception, but you just don't say the full story and thereby communicate a reality that is maybe not fully true. That's a tricky temptation when you have the choice to just leave something out that then will communicate. And you can say, well, I didn't lie. This, David is faced with this temptation here. He does not have to say that he saw Doeg the Edomite there, but he does. He acknowledges his responsibility. And he realizes, and so he, he realizes now that Saul, in, as a result of David seeing him and uh, as a result of that 
he's had a role to play in this. Uh, now, he didn't know that when Saul was told by Doeg what he would do, but he could have maybe put it together. So he says, stay with me. I will protect you because now we're both in the same boat. We, Saul is seeking to kill us both. Um, and so whereas Saul, so kind of where we are as we, as we wrap up and then we'll have time for a few more questions. And again, online people, if you have anything you want to say, type it in. Uh, Kind of my main main points here. First thing, early on, and we didn't spend too much time talking about this, but I think it's significant. David, who, as we said, is desperate, at the bottom of the barrel, at that moment, and we know he's praying because he writes psalms about this time, and uh, he may be angry at God because he writes psalms like those sometimes as well. But we know he's a man of prayer, and he would have been asking for help, even while he's doing things that are in an ethical gray area, like going to work for Gaff and pretending to be insane so that people don't kill him. Um, he is in this cave, and he's at the bottom of the barrel, and that's the point where he finds some provision from the Lord. He, his family, his family come from Bethlehem. They probably would have, they would have brought food, they would have brought supplies, they would have comforted him. So he has those people around him in his real moment of need. And as he receives this provision from the Lord, he also uh, uh, does what often happens when you receive a great gift, you also want to uh, then, that spills over in further acts of kindness. And here he wants to make a way for his parents to be safe. So that's something just to note here. This is, these stories don't tell us at the end of each chapter. And so what you should learn from this is this. It's just a story. But, they, but the story reveals, like all good literature, reveals the character of the people that are involved. And what you see about David is here is someone who um, receives God's provision and then wants to care even more for the people around him his, and his family. Um, you see something about his uh, heart for the downtrodden, that these 400 people that join him are those that are distressed or in debt or have some sort of issue with the current administration. That's number one. David receives God's provision and wants to extend that care to people around him, um, even when he's at the lowest point. The second thing is there is this um, a hint in this entire story of the kind of idea that Jesus makes very clear that the last should be first and the first should be last. The idea that uh, Jesus tells the Pharisees that uh, verily I say unto thee, the tax collectors and the prostitutes will go into the kingdom of God before you. You'll get in, but you'll be at the back of the line. And the real dirty, nasty people that you look down your nose upon, they're going to be the ones that go first. Uh, and we know this because in the story, this, this idea is hinted at because the king of Moab is nice to David, receives his mom and dad takes care of them for the entire time that David's on the run. This is like a multi-year commitment uh, to provide for these people, to give them housing, lodging, whatever they would need. So the king of Moab is good. The king of Israel, Saul, is bad. The last are first and the first last. The people you think are good are the bad guys. The people you think are bad are actually the good guys. Jesus breaks the Sabbath in the eyes of the people around him. He's the good guy. The Pharisees keep the Sabbath, but they're the bad guys. There's this, God's, uh, the gospel and God's way of working in the world flips things upside down. Jesus is born poor in a stable, whereas the real power is in Jerusalem or in Rome. And yet God shows us that those powers are nothing, but the power in the stable is everything. The poor uh, son of a carpenter. So, there's this, um, uh, again, this, this hint. When, when Jesus says, the, all the scriptures are about me, remember there's a scene at the end of Luke's gospel after the resurrection, Jesus is walking to Emmaus with two disciples, and they can't tell who he is because he's sort of like, you know, I imagine with the hood. He probably looked about as cool as this. And he's walking, he's talking with them, and he opens them to how the scriptures are. And, uh, I'm going to do this all day. I mean, you're paying attention, aren't you? So he's, and then at the end, he reveals, he's like, oh, I'm Jesus. And it says, like, the whole time, he, opened, he told the, the, the law, the, the prophets, it was all about him. 
And it doesn't mean that every single verse is a prophecy. There are some prophecies. But this kind of idea where it turns out the bad guy is the good guy and the good guy is the bad guy, this upside-down way of ordering the world, God working through the people that you think he shouldn't be able to work through, like the king of Moab, uh, this, is what, this is what it means when Jesus says that all the scriptures are about him. This is a pointing towards that, that Christological revelation that we get in Jesus. Um, Finally, you, there is some sort of, um, uh, I, I hate the, the books titled, you know, there's one, I don't hate, there's a strong word. I have, um, the, I find it problematic when books are titled things like Jesus CEO or Five Keys to Leadership from the Bible or something like that. Because the Bible was not written to be a guide of how to be a good leader of a, uh, uh, you know, a major supplier of air conditioning parts to the Midwest. Like, uh, that's not why, it was, why the Bible was written. However, there are certainly places where you can see through the examples of different characters what a, a, an effective leader looks like and what an ineffective leader looks like, what an effective human looks like. I mean, a leader is someone whose actions influence those around him to make a difference in the world. You could be a, a kindergarten teacher, you're a leader. You could be the head of a Fortune 500 company, you're a leader. Um, you could be a, a, a grandparent with 10 grandchildren, you're a leader, whatever it is. Um, and here you get these two case studies of leaders. You see how David reacts to crisis? He gets surrounded by family, he takes people around him, and he tries to uh, help them and protect them because he sees they're in need. Uh, and he acknowledges his own frailty, weakness, and his own need for help. Uh, and he's willing to collaborate with people that are maybe not entirely on the same page with him, like the king of Moab. Saul only surrounds himself with people that are like his kind of people. He will not even listen to them. He's on a purely transactional, I gave you this so you should give me loyalty forever no matter what I do. You should never question me. Everything I say is right. I'm never wrong. Anybody that's against me, I will destroy. Completely different kinds of leaders and there's something there we should look at and um, again as we as we we pray every Sunday here for our political leaders we're getting ready to head into an election season I already have ulcers about it um, and uh, there's there is I think sometimes um, when we when we use terms like somebody is a biblical leader or we want somebody with biblical values um, if you want to know what that looks like, this is, these are kind of case studies. Can somebody work with people who have different perspectives? Can somebody acknowledge when they're wrong? Uh, does someone have a compassionate attitude towards people around them or, and one that's open to being questioned, open to admitting fault versus someone who can never do that and um, will wipe the floor with anybody who questions them? So. These are some of the things we see in this passage, um, and uh, I think for and and also to look at ourselves. What are there parts? Are there times in my life where I've looked more like Saul than David? Are there parts in my life? You know, it's it's easy to look at leaders and then kind of look at the pantheon of leaders in our country or in the world and say that's a good one, that's a bad one. Okay, yes, but let's also look at the mirror. And other times where I have been unable to acknowledge my own fault. When, there, when I knew I was in the wrong, but I couldn't bring myself to say it. Are there um, times when I have felt like my relationships were transactional? I did give a lot of stuff to people in my family. And then they had the gall and the nerve to not be grateful for it. You know, that kind of speech. Uh, ha has this been me ever? So I think there's something there, and of course, once you realize that, now you're now you've now you've entered that land I like to call reality, and then you can begin to to dwell with God because God always lives in reality. As Jesus Christ says, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life." What does it mean to be the truth? It means you live in reality, and God always lives in reality. The more you can move out of denial and into reality, the closer one gets to God. Um, because in him there is no deception or lies. To the extent that you're deceiving yourself, you're moving away from God. So that ends today's class, unless there are any final questions, pot shots, uh, or bones to pick. All right.
Well, let's, uh, and I don't see anything in the chat. Nobody's chatting. Um, uh, Candy says that this passage reminds us of the best and worst of humanity. Yes, they exist simultaneously, even within ourselves. Um, so, yes, good point. Let us, uh, let us pray. Almighty God, thank you that you use the scriptures to reveal our own hearts to us. Help us as we see what's in there, both the good and the bad, that we bring those things to you. Tr help us to trust you when we are, like David, at the end of our rope. Help us to repent if we are ever looking a little bit more like King Saul. And in all things, remind us of your son, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. We pray in his name. Amen. Namaste. Namaste.